Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to another session with one class. My name is Bassam. I'm an engineering graduate, and today we're going to go. We're, today we're going to be going through some popular physics questions at the high school and preliminary university level. So let's get started over here with the first question. Okay, so our first question, let me just double check that you guys are seeing the whole page. All right, just give me a second over here. Okay. So we're gonna start off with question number one. So we're going to look at the question and then look at what the junior tutor provided as an answer and then we're going to walk step by step how to come about uh, the correct answer. So in this question, in order to get an object moving, you must push harder on it than it pushes back on you. If it is true or false, explain. So the junior tutor um, explains, when an object is pushed by a force, its motion is dependent on several factors. It depends on the normal force of the object opposite to the direction of the applied force, the weight of the object, the friction force acting on, on, on it with respect to the ground, the angle between the direction of the force and the direction of the motion. Hence, the statement is false. Only pushing harder will counter the normal reaction, but the rest of the parameters are still left to move the object. So this is um, not a complete answer. The main um, point to understand here is Newton's third law of motion. So write that down. Newton's third law of motion. And then this states for every action force, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. So equal meaning the same magnitude, opposite is just the opposite direction. So just looking at this statement here, in order to get an object moving, you must push harder than it pushes back on you. This wouldn't be true because if you push on an object, it will push back on you with the same magnitude force based on Newton's third law. So if we had an object here, we'd have like, FA force applied that you push on the object, the object will push back on you with um, the opposite force. So, um, the other concept here that is important to understand when to get an object moving, what actually has to happen is the applied force has to be greater than the static force of friction. That's what happens, not necessarily this statement. So, this statement is false. The true answer of this statement is um, the friction force. So let me just erase this here. So the applied force has to be greater than the force of static friction. So I'll, I'll say Fs. So the, there's the force of kinetic friction and there's the force of static friction. Static friction is associated with an object that's standing still and kinetic friction is with an object that is moving at a constant velocity or something like that. So here, if the applied force is greater than the static force of friction, that's when you get the object moving. So we'll just put a box around that. So here, correct answer, um, incomplete explanation. So this statement is false due to Newton's third law of motion. For every action force, there is an equal and opposite reaction force. All right, so we'll mark this as correct because they provide false. So they say depends and statement is false. So they say they, they give the correct answer, but the uh, incorrect explanation. Let's get on to the next question. So this is 
So question number two. So here we're asked the following. If the light strikes the mirror, the first mirror, at an angle of theta 1, what is the reflecting angle theta 2? So the junior tutor answers here, the reflected angle theta 2 will be the same as the incident angle theta 1 as compared to the normal line that is perpendicular to the point of incidence of the light ray with the mirror. The normal splits the total angle made by the incident ray in the reflected ray. So let's, um, to, to come to the conclusion that these two angles are the same, um, we, let's draw a diagram. So we have some mirror surface and we have light coming at the mirror surface. So here, um, the first angle is always the incident angle, and this is measured with respect to the normal. So the normal line will be perpendicular to the mirror. So we'll draw something like this. And there's a right angle over here. And we have theta one. And since this is a mirror surface, we know it'll bounce off like that. And we'll have theta two over here. So kind of the rule for this, for reflection on a mirror, is that theta 1 will equal theta 2. Um, mainly because uh, this is the mirror and it's just the property of the mirror. Um, and essentially theta 1 is the incidence or incident angle. And theta 2 is the reflected angle. And that's kind of um, what this, the diagram that this question is referring to. It's referring to kind of theta 1 over here. We have, a, we have a light ray that bounces off. And we know that the incident angle, theta 1, is equal to theta 2. So that's kind of answering what is the reflected angle, theta 2. So correct answer. Great job. Okay. Let's get on to the next question. So this is question number three. All right, so why do clothes often cling together after tumbling in a clothes dryer? So let's look at the answer provided by the junior tutor and then we'll think about what is the correct answer to this question? When clothes are dried in a, dr in a dryer, clothes get rubbed and the electrons on the outermost layer of clothes pass to other attached clothes. So we're talking about the transfer of electrons. Thus the charge on the clothes gets accumulated and adhesive force acts between the clothes, okay? Hence rubbing the clothes made the clothes charged. Clothes cling together when the dryer is dried. So this is the correct answer, um, but let's think about this with respect to kind of why this happens. So let's say we had I'll just make two boxes and each box represents pieces of clothes. Okay, let's just say these are kind of tumbling around in the dryer. And each one has kind of, let's say, a certain set of electrons. So a certain set of, let's say, yeah, so four electrons and let's say four, let's say, protons or positively charged. So it has four positive charged particles and for negatively charged, so this is, these are neutral, so they're initially neutrally charged. There's no charge to associate this, associated to them, and we'll say that both both of them have the same kind of amount of charges. So in reality, there's a lot more of this, but just for understanding, this is what we're going to go through. So let me just erase this and redraw it above. So when when we rub two pieces of clothes together, essentially electrons start moving um, between them. So we'll have, let's say this piece of clothing will transfer some electrons. So some electrons will hop off. So we'll erase this one and this one. And now we have two more electrons on this piece of clothing. So after this rubbing in the dryer, uh, what ends up happening is we end up with um, the piece of clothing on the left side will be more positively charged 
because there's more positive charges than negative. It initially was neutral because there was a transfer of electrons, it becomes positively charged. And the second piece of clothing that um, obtained the electrons will become negatively charged. And because we know um, opposites attract, so a positively charged um, particle or a positively charged piece of clothing will be attracted to a negatively charged. So if they were both positive, they would not attract. Um, but because there's a positive charge on one piece of clothing and a negative um, charge on another piece of clothing, we get this attractive force, and that's why you have the clinging. Um, and that's kind of the explanation. And and this this has a, a name to this effect, and it's called the triboelectric effect. So the junior tutor answers this question correctly, and I hope this explains why we have the cling because of the transfer of electrons. So correct answer. Great job. And we'll mark this solution as correct. Okay, let's get to the next question. So the next question is question number four. Okay, so this question is asking, if Earth were twice as far from the Sun, so let's say initially we had the Earth over here and the Sun. The, this distance is obviously, is obviously not proportional. Let's say we have some islands and this is the Earth. Okay. So if the Earth was twice as far from the Sun, the force of gravity attach, attracting Earth to the Sun would be. So we're trying to think about, we have some distance R, okay, and we have the force of gravity between these two objects. So the Earth and the Sun, and we have the distance R between them. So let's look at what the attempted solution by the junior tutor and uh, we'll look at how to come about the correct answer. So as we know, the force of gravity between two masses is directly proportional to the product of the masses and inversely, to the, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. So this is just the equation for the force of gravity between two objects or the attractive force where g is just the gravitational constant and m, m is just the mass, the first mass, the second mass, and then divided by r squared, the distance between them. And this is kind of the explanation of the variables. Now, if this distance was twice, um, then the force would be two times r, and we end up with four in the bottom, and we know that um, the force is a quarter times because of the double distance. So let's think about this. So we have the equation fg is g times m, S M E divided by R squared. So the main thing to note here is we have the squared on the R, which is the distance between them. So if we were to double the distance, so we have 2R, the distance between the sun and the earth. Now we need to kind of just substitute that in. So if we were to substitute this in, we would get, so everything on top would stay the same. And then we put this in brackets, so we have 2r squared. So knowing this, let's erase a little bit of the board here. Make some space. So we have fg. And then this would get us fg is equal to g ms me over 4r squared. So you can see we're, we're left with the same equation, but we have this four number in the denominator. So we have the four here. Okay, so knowing this, um, we have to relate how this impacts FG on this side. So initially we didn't have the four in the bottom, but now after doubling the distance, we end up with a four in the denominator. So we know if we divided the original equation, so just kind of this, the original equation is this component 
and we divided that by 4. So if we did G M S M E over R squared, which is just FG, the original force of gravity, divide that by 4, we'd end up with the 4 over here. So we know that FG will be a quarter of what it originally was when we doubled the distance. Um, so that's kind of how to um, think about how to get the that answer. So I'll write it on the right side over here. So FG would be a quarter. Um, when we double the speed. And this is mainly because not double the speed, sorry, double the distance. So uh, the, the main reason here also is because FG is inversely proportional. So you could say that FG is inversely proportional to 1 over R squared. And we have the R squared component, which gives us the the 2 times 2 squared, which gives us 4 in the denominator. So we can mark this uh, answer as correct. So. All right, so a job, correct answer, and we'll mark this as correct. So let's move on to the next question, which is question number five. So here we're kind of given a fill in the blank. Okay, and it's asking us, the blank is a plane perpendicular to the optic axis through the focal point. So we need to know what is the term for a plane that has these attributes. So perpendicular to the optic axis and through the focal point. So let's draw a simple diagram, a lens diagram for these kind of components. So to start off, we'll have our lens. It could be concave or convex. We'll stick to convex for now. And we have some, um, an axis right through the middle. So this isn't um, directly in the middle, but here I'll redraw the line again. So it's directly in the middle. So it'll be something like this. So we have an axis directly in the middle, and this is our optic axis. We also have uh, a focal point, so we'll have, let's say, a focal point here, F. We'll also have F over here. And essentially, the plane that is perpendicular to the optic axis and through the focal point, so we'd be looking at something, some plane that goes through this. So we have some plane over here, and the name of, uh, of this plane is the focal plane. So focal because we're going through the focal point, so focal plane. And that is kind of the blank for here. So let's go through what the junior tutor said. So in optics, the measurement of the distance of the object and the image is measured on the optic axis, also known as the principal axis. So principal axis is just another name for the optic axis. The optical device is kept at the origin of the optic axis and the focal point lies on this plane. A focal point has a plane perpendicular to the optic axis known as the focal plane. So focal plane is the answer. The focal plane and the optic axis intersect each other at the focal point. So this is the correct answer provided by the junior tutor and we just went through the diagram that helps explain, you know, where does this focal plane lie on this um, lens diagram. Right, so correct answer. Great job. All right, and we'll mark this as correct. Let's move on to the next question. This is question number six. Okay. All right, just give me a second over here. All right, so 
This question is asking us what is the magnitude of the gravitational force acting on the Earth due to the Sun? Right, let me just grab this over here. All right, so um, this would essentially use the following equation for gravitational force. So we have Fg equals G times M1 times M2 divided by r squared, and r is just the distance between two objects. So here we have the Earth, so we'll change the subscript. We'll change this subscript to Earth and this one to the Sun. So here, say E and S. Okay, and we have to kind of just plug and chug here and just input the values. So I'm gonna look at the junior tutor's answer. So here, um, they provide the correct equation, and they obtain the correct values for the mass of the sun and the earth and distance. So here, we just have to plug these in. So we'll plug this into our calculator to double check that the junior tree to provide the correct answer. So our gravitational constant is 6.674 times 10 to the negative 11. Um, and then we multiply that by the mass of the Earth, which is 6. So mass of the Earth is right here. 6 times 10 to the power 24. And then we multiply that by the mass of the Sun, which is over here. We have 2 times 10 to the 30. And we divide that by r squared, the distance between the two objects. So 1.5 times 10 to the power of 11 squared, and we end up with the following. So this will equal 3.56 times 10 to the 22. So this will be newtons. So looking at the answer, so they get 3.523, so this is approximately the same. So we might have missed a decimal place here, but we both get the correct answer for the force between the magnitude of the force acting on the Earth due to the sun. So this is our answer. So we'll mark this answer as correct. Great job. And we'll move on to question number seven. Okay, let's clear the board. So question number seven. All right, so, um, so let's read through this question. So bromine has two naturally occurring isotopes, BR79 and BR81, and has an atomic mass of 79.904. So let's just write down some given. So bromine, yeah, bromine 79, first isotope, and bromine 81. We know the atomic mass of bromine is, so I'll just write BR79.904. And this is AMU. AMU. All right. And the mass of bromine 81 is 80.9163. So 80 this is bromine 81. Yep. 9163 and its natural abundance is 49 I'll write this a little smaller actually so 3 and then 49.31 percent okay so we're give, and then we're asked to calculate the mass and natural abundance of BR79. So here, mass and natural abundance. So what is the answer? So let's go through what the junior tutor said, and we'll go through how to get to the correct answer. So the junior tutor says to determine, calculate the mass and percentage 
from the given data. Mass percentage of abundance R and respectively. So here, you know, I think there's just some missing values. Not sure if this was just by accident. So, so there's some missing values here. So the talk mass represents is as blank. Here is the number. So they go through the process. So let's just run through the process of how to go about um, getting the answer here. Okay, so the first thing we have to understand is that because we have two um, naturally occurring isotopes here, we would get, or the, let's, let's answer the first part. So we, we can easily find the natural abundance of bromine 79. So by the way, this is kind of a chemistry question, not really a physics question, but we're going to go through it anyways. So, so for the abundance of bromine 79, we can easily say 100%. So minus 49.3, 1 percent, and this will give us the abundance, because we know we only have two isotopes, and they both have to kind of add up to 100 percent, so, uh, and we'll get, we, we'll end up getting 50, so just doing some mental math over here, you can plug this into your calculator, 0.69 percent. So let's just double check this. So 100 minus 49.31, yep, 50.69. So this is answering one part of the question. So this is the abundance of bromine 79. And now to calculate the mass. So we know the total, or not the total, the, the actual mass of bromine is 79.904. And we know the two isotopes give us, for, for our bromine 81, this is the mass. and we don't know the mass for bromine 79. So we can use kind of the weighted average of the two isotopes and their abundance. So we'll say, we'll represent the mass of 79 by the variable x. We'll say x equals question mark. And we'll say, so x times 50.69. We'll put that in decimal places, 50.69 plus. 80, so this number over here, 0.916 times 0 0.4931, and this should give us 79.901. Underline some numbers. So we got 79.904 from up here. Okay. And we obtained 80.9163 from up here. So I actually missed uh, a number. So there should be a three. And we have 49.931. 49.31, sorry, and we put this in decimal spot over here, and then 50.69, uh, and we put that in a decimal um, notation. So let's go back over here. Okay. So we have the three over here. I'm gonna erase some space up top to do this calculation. We'll erase this. Okay. So essentially, all we have to do is rearrange. So to rearrange, we and solve for x. So x would equal. So we know we have 79.904, so we'll say 79.904, and then we have to subtract this on both sides of the equation. So minus 80, um, let me write a little smaller because this is, this won't fit on the page, so I'll just write a little smaller so we can fit everything on one page. So 
79.904 minus 80.9163 times 0 0.49 three one okay so essentially we had the 79.904 over here on this side of the equation we subtracted 80 point this kind of term um, to isolate for x and then we're left with this on the left side so we just divide both sides by that so we'll end up with 0 0.5069 on the bottom so we had it over here and we just divided it out to get it to the other side. So here we kind of just put, plug this into our calculator and we'll get the value for the mass of bromine 79. So just plug this in. So we'll say 79.904 minus 80.9163 times 0 0.4931 divided by 0 0.50 5069 and we end up with 78.919 and that's the second answer to the second um, so the mass of bromine 79 so we answered the second component of the question so here we have the mass is 78.91 amu am So A, M, U, and the uh, abundance is 50.69% from what we calculated previously. So we'll, so incomplete solution um, for bromine 79. The mass is so 78.919 AMU and the abundance is 50.69%. So here the junior tutor doesn't provide the full kind of numerical answer. So we went through the um, calculation and did the math here. And we'll mark this as incorrect. All right, let's keep going to the next question. So it's question number eight. Let me write it up here. So question number eight. Right, so let's look at this question. So the picture shows a motion diagram. So yep, we have a picture down here. So the picture shows a motion diagram. The dots represent the object's position at moments separated by equal intervals of time. So between each dot, there's an equal time interval. So between all the dots. So between this dot and this dot and this dot and this dot, the same amount of t um, time passes. The dots are connected by arrows representing the object's average velocity during the corresponding time interval. So these arrows represent average velocity. Right, the question here is which of these situations describe the motion shown in the motion diagram at point A. So they give us a bunch of situations and they want us to look at point A over here and think about which situations could be represented by point A. So let's look at the answer provided by the junior tutor and let's think about what is the correct answer. So they say A and D. So reason in a velocity of a car is constant and arrow uh, a is the same length, represents the equal velocity in D. So they're ref they're presenting constant velocity. So when there's constant velocity, so if we look at A, a car is moving along straight load at constant speed. So yes, constant velocity. And then D, a hockey puck slides along a smooth, frictionless, icy surface. So this is also constant velocity. And that's what's happening at point A. So let's go through each option and think about why it's correct or incorrect. So option A. So option A, a car moving along a straight load at constant speed. So we've already 
said that at point A, there's constant speed. We can see at point B the velocity afterwards compared to the velocity before has become smaller. So the object is slowing down at point A. The vector before and the vector afterward is the same, so constant velocity. And at point C, you can see uh, a shorter vector compared to the one after, and that's we can see that there's acceleration. So we're looking at the scenarios where there's constant velocity. A, it has constant velocity or speed, so constant speed is correct. Let's go look at um, B. Car is moving along a straight road while slowing down. So slowing down means deceleration and a decrease in speed. So this is not constant velocity. So we'll mark that as wrong. Option C, a car is moving along a straight road while speeding up. So speeding up, we have acceleration. So they're, they're trying to say straight road to kind of throw you off, but really you only care about if it's speeding up or slowing down. So this is also incorrect because it's not constant speed. Okay. Option D, a hockey, ply, a hockey puck slides on a smooth, frictionless, icy surface. So pay attention to this word, frictionless. Frictionless means there's no friction force which means there's no deceleration. So if the object, if the hockey puck is sliding, it's sliding at constant speed and nothing is slowing it down. So knowing this, we know this is a constant speed answer, so we know this is correct. So in comparison to E, a hockey puck slides along a rough concrete surface. So this option is telling us there's a rough concrete surface, therefore there's a friction force that is decelerating the hockey puck. And we know that E is incorrect because it doesn't have constant speed. So E, I mark that as wrong. Let's go to F. So F. So a cockroach is speeding up from rest. So speeding up from rest, that's acceleration. That's pre pretty straightforward. That's incorrect. There's no constant speed there. So G. Right, a rock is thrown horizontally, air resistance is negligible. So well, let's think about this. So if a rock is thrown horizontally, what would be happening? So it would kind of give you some projectile motion. And essentially, let's say you threw it just straight out. Um, so you, you had some rock and you just threw it in this direction. We know that there's a force of gravity acting on the rock, and it'll slowly like go start going downward until it hits the ground. So knowing this, we know that in the y direct in the x direction, sorry, there's no acceleration force. Um, if it's kind of if starts off starts off at a like some speed the the speed in the x direction will stay constant however in the y direction there is a force of gravity acting on it that force of gravity accelerates the object down so we know even though the air resistance is negligible we know that in the y direction there's an acceleration force so we can't say this is correct we have to mark this as wrong so depending on how the question is phrased so maybe if they were a little more specific so if the rock is thrown horizontally and we don't only care about the x direction maybe then it will be true but this is not completely true so h a rock is thrown horizontally air resistance is substantial so same idea even even when air is so adding this component here it just says that there's also deceleration in the x direction and y direction because of air resistance down so both are incorrect here so h also does not have constant speed So a rock is dropped vertically, air resistance is negligible, so I and then J, a rock is dropped vertically, air resistance, is sub air resistance is substantial. So it's dropped vertically or horizontally, force of gravity and acceleration is always happening, regardless of which direction you, you drop the rock or throw the rock. So in all scenarios, G through J, they will always have that force of gravity, there's always going to be that acceleration downward, so they're all incorrect and they don't have constant velocity so we can't mark those as true
So x here incorrect, and j does not have constant velocity. So really, the only two that we have here is a is correct and d is correct. And I believe, yes, this is the same solution provided by the junior tutor, and this answer is correct. So, correct answer. Great job. And we'll mark this as correct. And let's go to the next question. Okay. So the next question is question number nine. Okay. When a light beam emerges from water into the air, the average light speed is what? So we have two mediums, water and air, and we're thinking about light speed. So we know in a vacuum, so when there's nothing, essentially just nothing, in a vacuum, we know that the speed of light is represented by the variable C, and it will equal 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So that's in a vacuum. Let's look at what the junior tuner has answered here. So when light beam emerges from water to air, so we're looking at from a denser material to a less dense material, and there's a change in the speed of light as it is moving from denser to rarer. So rarer is just less dense, medium, so the average speed of light increases. This is the property of light that when it enters into denser medium, its speed decreases. When it moves out of the denser medium to rarer mediums, its speed increases. This is called the refraction of light, Light bends when it enters a different medium to the change in its wavelength. So this is the correct answer. So let's go through and think about what this means. So we think about the following equation. So the speed in any medium should equal, so the speed of light in any medium should equal the speed of light in a vacuum divided by some index of refraction represented by the variable n. So we know the, these values for kind of um, the medium, so n for a vacuum will equal 1. It will be equal 1.0. For air, it will be very close to 1. It will be a little over 1, so we'll just say approximately 1. But it will be a little greater, a little bigger than 1 for air. For water, it will be much more than what it is for air. So we know for water, it will be much greater than 1. We can look up the value exactly, but we don't need to know that for this question. So here we're going from water into the air. So if we plug the, if we increase the n, which is represented by these values, so we had for vacuum is the first one, for air and for water. So for water, the n, the index of refractions increased. We know it will be inversely proportional to the velocity of the in velocity of light in the medium. So Vm will decrease because n has increased. And n is in the denominator, so increasing the denominator will decrease this entire value. And we'll end up with a lower m. Vm, sorry. So we know in this medium, so in the medium of water, the speed will be less than than if the n value was lower. So if as you go lower, and so in this direction, as we go lower and lower until we reach the vacuum index of refraction, we will end up with a higher speed. But as we go the opposite direction, so to denser mediums, we'll have a lower speed of light. So looking at this, we're going from water to air. So we know that we're going from a dense medium to a less dense medium. So we know water will be slower. Um, the speed of light will be slower, and then we go into air, the speed of light will be faster. So we can, so we have, let's say we have water over here, and then air, we have some beam, and then it gets refracted, so the angle changes. Um, we know here we have n will be a little greater than 1, and then for air, n will be 
about a little a tiny bit greater than one, but it'll be much closer to one than water, and that's why we get slower speed in water and higher speed in air. And then we know the average speed of light will increase. So this is the same um, answer as the junior tutor, and we know that we we verified the junior tutor's solution. So we here we can say correct answer. Great job. And we'll say solution is correct. So, and we'll go on to the next question. So this is question number 10. All right. Okay. So here we're asked, increasing the mass attached to, sp to a spring will increase the angular frequency of its vibration. So we have some mass, so there's a wall, and we have a mass over here. And it's attached by some spring, like, like so. And we're wondering what happens when we increase mass. If we increase mass, what will be the effect on the angular frequency? So what happens to angular frequency? Put a question mark. Let's go through with the junior tu tutor answer. So mass m attached to a spring. Spring constant k is hanging vertically. So we're saying it's hanging vertically. So here doesn't really state. It's stretched to a vertical distance x and released. The hanging mass starts, starts oscillating. The frequency is as follows, and the angular frequency is as follows. Also, by substituting the values of k and m from the equation, plus the angular frequency does not depend on the mass of the object, hence increasing the mass will not affect the angular frequency. So, so if it's hanging vertically here, um, this is true based on the free body diagram. And we are able to substitute in, but if so, if we're thinking about it, if it's if it's if it looks like this, this equation down here would not necessarily apply. This equation uh, applies more to a pendulum because it's swinging back and forth, and the force of gravity is affecting it. In our diagram here, we, the force of gravity does not affect the x direction over here. But we can even still look at this equation. So the the equation for the angular frequency is the spring constant divided by the mass. So even if we were to increase mass, since mass is in the denominator, so if we were to increase this, the entire, so all of this will decrease. So W will go down. So if it was, so here we're saying increasing the mass attached to the spring will increase the angular frequency. So this is false. So we know that the answer is false. If it was hanging vertically, um, the junior tutor here describes that you can substitute this based on the free body diagram. And you will get the following. And because length here, so length here, so M, so G, K, X. So X is substituted here to get length. So you, you'll end up with this equation, and you'll have that mass does not affect um, the oscillation. So both in both scenarios here, um, usually when I think about this question, I look at it in this diagram. So the, the question here doesn't really specify. But if, if we had this kind of diagram, we know if we increase the mass here, the angular frequency here would decrease. And if it was vertically hanged, it, it would be the same thing. So. We would never, this statement in any scenario would always be false. So in the scenario presented by the junior and in the scenario that we just went through right here. So correct answer, great job. And we'll mark this solution as correct. Let's clear the page. So question number 11. So, 
excuse me. So we're asked here when light, let me just, so when light um, reflects from surface, there's a change in its what? So we have some surface, we have light coming, up, coming over here. So this is supposed to be actually a straight line. So we have light and it bounces off the surface like so. And we're wondering what what is I guess the term to change? Like what is what is going on right here? What what's changing? Okay, so let's let's go and look at what the junior tuner answered here. So when the light gets reflected through the surface, then there changes only in the direction of the propagation of the wave as the ray strikes the boundary between the two mediums or media. In the case of reflection, there is no change in the speed of light. It will be constant, so the frequency of the light waves is also constant. The change in the speed of light happens in the case of refraction. As the wavelength is changed, we are able to see the objects around as due to reflection. So here we only care about reflection. So when reflection happens, we know the only thing that really changes, even let's say we draw a normal line here, the speed or the velocity will stay the same. We're staying in the same medium. We're staying in the same medium over here. So we know the only thing that really changes is the direction. Because it get, it kind of just bounces off the surface. So this is really the answer. This is more of a fact-based question. So there's not really much walk through. And, uh, the junior tutor gives you a more sophisticated explanation of um, you know, the wavelength stays the same of the light. That's why you have kind of the same magnitudes and stuff like that. All you really need to know here is that there's a change of direction whenever light reflects. In the scenario of refraction, we know that the speed of light changes uh, as well as the direction when there's two different mediums. So here we know that the solution is correct. So correct answer. Great job. And we'll mark this as correct. Okay, let's move on to the next question. This is question number 12. Okay, so among the two isotopes of chlorine, 3517 chlorine and 3717, so we have chlorine okay so we have um, the we have two isotopes of chlorine which isotope is the most abundant so we have to think about chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 and think about which one has the most abundance so if you went to the periodic table you can see that the atomic mass of chlorine is 35.45 amu. Okay, so before we go through the explanation of how to think about this question, let's look at what the junior tutor presented. So chlorine is the most stable of the two isotopes. Um, that is chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. So chlorine is just the more the most stable version of the two isotopes. The most naturally occurring isotope in abundance is chlorine 35, which contributes to 75%, and chlorine 37, which contributes to 25%. In chlorine 37, so it goes on to describe the number of protons and neutrons. So the periodic table, the average relative atomic mass of chlorine, 30, chlorine is 75%, chlorine 35 will give you 35.5. So um, this, if you were to look at this question by itself, this is kind of a not a clear way to think about it, but a clear way to think about why chlorine 35 is more abundant is to look at just this number over here. So 35 and 37. So for these two isotopes, that's the atomic mass for each isotope. And if we were to do kind of the weighted average when we're using abundance, we would get 35.45. So thinking about this, um, since 35.45 is closer to 35, we know that chlorine 35 has to have a higher abundance for our weighted average equation to give us this value. 
So we know this abundance will be higher than chlorine 37. So, and, and looking at the answer, so if we had 75% chlorine 35, so if we had 75% and 25%, this makes sense because we have higher abundance of chlorine 35, we will end up with a number um, for chlorine, um, the mass of chlorine that is closer to 35. So we can right away, without even doing any math, we can say that chlorine 35 has the higher abundance, so chlorine 35, just because 35 for the isotope, so the atomic mass of the isotope, is closer to the weighted average of all isotopes um, for chlorine, which is 35.45, than 37. So 35 is just closer to 35.45. So we'll mark this answer as correct. Correct answer. So chlorine 35 has higher abundance because 35 AMU is closer to 35.45 AMU, which is the atomic mass of chlorine. So I realize this is more of a chemistry question, not a physics question, but we went through it anyways, and we kind of figured out how to think about this question and get to the right answer. So I'll mark this as correct. Okay. All right, so that was the final question for today's session. Hopefully you found this session, session helpful. And if you want more homework help, you can always go to oneclass.com or visit the link in the description. Uh, also, you can send a like on this video and subscribe to um, see more YouTube content provided by one class. I'll see you guys in the next session. Goodbye for now.